Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on some of the practical issues related to lenacapavir, but I'm also going to spend a significant amount of time helping you to understand the mechanism of this drug. This is a novel capsid inhibitor. This is a first in class to market of a capsid inhibitor. And because this is an entirely new class of drugs, it really requires, I think, a little special attention to talk about the mechanism of the action. I, I do not have any conflicts. A couple of quick background pieces of information on lenacapavir. This is in the category, as I said, as a capsid inhibitor. The proposed indication that we may hear about in December is for heavily treated persons with multi-drug resistance. That's what I'm going to focus on today. I'm not going to talk a lot about lenacapavir for PrEP or as initial therapy. I think that's going to be a topic to follow up on in a several months, but I am going to focus on what we are going to probably see for the FDA approval, which is for people with multi-drug resistance. For those of you that have kind of tracked this, this is actually a resubmission to the FDA, and this occurred in July, and this isn't because there was suddenly a problem with the drug. The problem was the vials where the drug was being manufactured and for the subcutaneous form, and there were problems with compatibility. So in the reapplication, they have this new vial that has been resubmitted with it. So uh, I don't want people to get confused about the initial submission was pulled, not because of a complication of the drug, it was the vial issue. It appears that this drug's going to move forward in both an oral and a long-acting subcutaneous injection. And the oral preparations that we're going to see, I'll go over in just a minute. There's basically a loading oral regimen that you use, but eventually this will probably be looked at in terms of weekly dosing and daily dosing uh, long-term. But I'm going to focus on what initially, again, we're going to look for the FDA approval and including the long-acting subcutaneous injection every six months. This is what the game changer is. We have not had a long acting drug like this. Every six months really changes, I think, a lot of potential implementation issues compared to some of the problems we've had with implementing cabotegravir. I think there's going to be a lot simpler implementation of this every six months subcutaneous injection. The last thing to mention is that because this is a novel class, there is no known overlapping resistance with integrase resistance or protease resistance or NRTI resistance. So I think that's a, an obvious great thing to know right up front is that this drug really should be highly effective essentially for almost everyone. Now, looking at the lenacapavir dosing schedule, this is a visual for this to kind of give you a sense how we're going to be using it. It's going to have this loading doses for day one and two, which is two tablets. This is what I think it's going to be. This drug is FDA approved in Europe, and these are the dosing that they've used in the FDA approval in Europe. This is what I think we're going to see in the U.S. 300 milligram tablets and a subcutaneous dose of 463.5 milligrams. So basically, there's these loading two pills, day one, day two, a day eight, 300 milligram, and then from there on. At day 15, you're using the subcutaneous injection every six months. So again, a loading preparation and then subcutaneous thereafter. So let's step back now and look at the mechanism of action of lenacapavir. And this is very complicated compared to a lot of other mechanisms that I'll go in because it's a multi-step mechanism of action. So first thing is, it's a capsid inhibitor. So many people aren't familiar with what capsid is. So I, first of all, want to address what is HIV capsid. So let's look at the eight cross section of HIV. This is just a schematic, you know, the outer envelope. But when we're looking and talking about capsid, we are talking about this whole core of the virus that is coated with a protein called capsid. So the terminology is a little bit confusing, but this entire core is also commonly referred to as capsid or capsid core. Here on, I'm going to be referring to this entire structure, like the entire core of the virus as the core. 
Whereas when we're talking about the actual protein, the actual protein P24 is called HIV capsid. So this is where the terminology can be confusing. Different people use different terms. I personally like to talk about the entire structural integrity of this cone-like structure as the HIV core, the individual protein that is the shell that coats this is the HIV capsid protein. The HIV capsid protein, there are more than a thousand of these molecules that make up this conical structure. And this is just a three-dimensional type look at this to give you a little bit better feel. Notice there's sort of two different colors here. And, and, and what we are talking about with these two different colors is that in this conical structure, there's a hexamer capsid structure, and then there's a pentamer capsid structure. These subunits of the core are very important when we get to talking about how this core gets assembled, disassembled, and squeezed through the nuclear pore. So, so those elements are all important when we talk about it. So now let me just look at what actually happens, how we get capsid put together in the first place. So HIV gag is the protein that is the precursor where we get capsid. So think of gag as like a long sort of big polyprotein that has to be chopped up by protease. Well, one of the things that gets released when it's chopped up is capsid. And these capsid or P24 monomers then congeal together to form mostly hexamers and occasional pentamers. Then these structures form an even bigger structure, this conical core. So it's made up predominantly of hexamers, but there are a few pentamers. Again, understanding how all this comes together is very important when we get to the mechanism. So let's step back. Let's take an entire sort of 60,000 foot view of the HIV life cycle. And I won't go through this step by step, but I just wanna highlight three things in this overall life cycle, how the capsid is relevant. So first of all, the capsid has to be transported from the cytoplasm into the nucleus, as I'm showing over here to the left. We used to think the capsid was completely dissolved as soon as it hit the cytoplasm, that has now been revised, and now it's believed that the capsid remains intact or almost entirely intact throughout the cytoplasm into the nuclear core. So completely different understanding of our pathogenesis of HIV. So the capsid is now viewed as this coating of this essential core that needs to deliver the package from the cytoplasm all the way into the nucleus where then you can go on and have integration. So think of this as an incredibly value package that needs to be delivered into the nucleus. So one of the things is it has to be squeezed through this nuclear pore. It has to have a little bit of flexibility in terms of getting through there. So if it gets too stiff, that can interrupt how it is squeezed through the nuclear pore. That's called nuclear transport. The second thing is that the cap for integration to occur, you've got to get the HIV DNA out of there. So RNA is turned to DNA during this whole process, HIV reverse transcription, and then the DNA has got to come out of there. So you have to disassemble the capsid at some point. And then the third thing to highlight is that as the HIV is forming, I was showing you gag a second ago. Well, gag lines up all along the HIV as it's budding off like spokes in a wheel. And there's multiple chops along here from the protease enzyme and the HIV gag protein is released and then eventually assembles together to form this core. And that's actually called the assembly and the budding and the maturation step. So this thing all has to come together and be put together uh, in a final product. So how is this relevant for lenacapavir? Well, lenacapavir works in multiple steps. So number one, it interrupts this effective squeezing through or movement through the nuclear pore. Second, it prevents the normal disassembly of this conical structure. And third, it messes up the process when this has all been chopped up and it now needs to be assembled as this core in the virus that's going off to leave the cell and infect new cells. So let me just go just a little bit further into a couple of these steps. Okay, so how does lenacapavir then technically do that? Well, 
Here's stepping back to the structures of how they're all put together. So again, you have these monomers that start to join together to form these hexamers and occasional pentamers. And think of this as this kind of like a giant assembly line where all these things are being put together. What linacapavir does is that it binds between these subunits and essentially it acts like the hinge on a door where it sort of makes them stuck together in a very stiff way. So that can be, you know, could be potentially good or could be bad, depending on what you're trying to do. But in this case, what it actually, it's to our advantage and that it inhibits some of the processes in the HIV life cycle. So now let me give you a sense for if you hinge all these things together, what the potential implication is of that. So what happens is the capsider coats this entire core and this entire core has to be squeezed through the nuclear pore. And you can imagine if it's too stiff, that's a problem. But the other thing that's very important is that to squeeze through this pore, everything that's shown in color here, these orange and yellow proteins and blue proteins are human proteins that actually are adapted to assist the core squeezing through the nuclear pore, especially the CPSF6 protein. So what we know from the capsid inhibitors and linacapavir is that if it's bound all along in here, it does two things. It makes this thing too stiff. So it's like a hinge all stuck together. So the flexibility that it needs is gone to squeeze through here. But secondly, it blocks the binding of multiple of these nuclear poor proteins and this CPSF6 protein, which is also like a protein you can think of as a welcoming party that helps to squeeze it through and bring it into the nucleus. So again, this is the cytoplasm out here to the left. This is the nucleus. This is this entire core, which does deliver in the package. It's got everything in here we need, and it's delivering the package, and it needs to get into the nucleus. Second thing linacapavir does, if it's hinged all along here and all these structures are stuck together too stiffly, this thing can't come apart easily. So you can imagine that all these hinges on here, where you've got to disassemble to free the viral products to be able to go on in replication. And if you block that, you're going to be blocking the downstream integration step. And then the third step is that, again, if you have all of this binding, what happens is that it almost accelerates this thing after it's all chopped up, if these things all start hinging together too quickly, the capsid as it's assembling in the very late phase of the HIV life cycle, basically starts hinging together too quickly and the shape gets very misshapen, too stiff, too out of shape. It doesn't all come together right. So the actual formation of the capsid is disrupted as well. So you can see there are these multiple steps of inhibition and lenacapavir. Now, let me just focus on the one study that is probably going to get this drug FDA approved, and it's lenacapavir and multidrug resistant HIV. This was published in the New England Journal a couple months ago. It is called the Capella study. So very complicated design. So I'm going to try and break this down and just hit a couple of the high points. Let's look at the background over here. This is a phase three randomized trial. There's an oral and a sub-Q component to linacapavir, just like I've been talking about, and it's versus sort of the optimized background therapy. So, you know, a person who's failing therapy, you know, we throw together what we've got, it's not working, that's optimized background therapy. So these are people who are adults, or I'm not adults, but 12 and older, virologic failure, they had to have a detectable viral load for at least eight weeks, multi-drug class resistant HIV, um, and they have to have at least one fully active agent in the so-called optimized background therapy. OBT is going to be representing optimized background therapy. Okay, so the thing I'm going to start off on first is this functional monotherapy. So think of this essentially as the first step was they took people who were failing and they just threw linacapavir on top of it, nothing else. So that's monotherapy. That's how these drugs, when they first get FDA approved, that's kind of the first thing you look at. And that's versus placebo. Why do you do that? You're looking to see just what kind of viral load reduction you get with this. So this is what you get. This is looking at lenacapavir after only the oral loading at day 15. Only the oral loading, there's a two log reduction compared to the placebo essentially getting nothing. So very, very nice viral load reduction, just over 15 days, or over 14 days with the oral lenacapavir. Now the other part of the study, which is really complicated, 
essentially is everything that I've been telling you about, which is the regimen that I showed you, you know, that 600 milligram day one, day two, then the 300 milligram, then the sub Q injection. And the only difference here is these people were getting it as part of a randomized trial, but with this initial part, and these are the non-randomized group, but you should think of it essentially as what I'm going to show you is what happens if you take people on failing regimen, you give them lenacapavir with this regimen that we've outlined, and you, you throw this in with optimized background therapy with at least one agent. So this is what you get thinking about like how it might work in clinical practice. And this is what you get. Randomized trial part, non-randomized, they're both basically getting the same regimens. Okay, so basically you found about 80% or so of the people had an undetectable VAR load at week 26. That's pretty good. When you look at most of these deep salvage advanced you know, studies, that would be a high viral load suppression in these studies. And then again, you can see the rates for people of HIV RNA, at least 50 copies, and then no virologic data was in three of the individuals in the cohort. So this pretty much tells you that as a add-on for people with virologic failure, this drug could be a nice addition to our armamentarium. Now, what do we know about lenacapavir and resistance? We're just starting to learn this. Can you form resistance to lenacapavir? Yes. So let me make a distinction. If you take somebody who's already been on antiretroviral therapy, is it likely they're going to be resistant to lenacapavir if they've never seen it before? No, a new class of drug. But once you start lenacapavir, can you develop resistance? The answer to that is absolutely yes. And they've already identified these seven mutations at six amino acid positions. Now, the capsid gene is it's the GAG, the GAGPOL. That is where reverse transcriptase, a protease, integrase. There's actually no reason at all why routine genotypes shouldn't be able to add in the GAG region that includes the capsid region in this future you know, genotype. So probably there'll be a separate genotype initially for this, but eventually hopefully we'll have more pan genotypes that include integrase and that would include the capsid region as well too. So what about future studies coming down the road? They're looking at initial therapy. This is actually ongoing. It's been presented at conferences called the Calibrate, has not been published, so I'm not going to talk about it today. This is lenacapavir in this regimen that we're talking about, both PO sub Q with TAF FTC as initial therapy. So compared to BIC TAF FTC. So I think we'll get an idea of how this might play out. Again, it's not an all injection regimen because you still got the oral component, but that's initial therapy. They're looking at some oral daily therapy. And then there's subcutaneous injections that are looking every six months with different possible combinations. The real disappointment was this latrovir was moving forward with this. And there's a lot of complicated issues with that, with this latrovir right now. So that was disappointing in terms of some of the multi every six month type platform that could have been going moving forward. The last thing to mention is that this is under study, uh, sub-Q injections every six months for PrEP and the purpose one and purpose two trials. And again, not going to talk about that because we don't have adequate data on that, but think about that as a potential sort of, you know, something to think about that really could get your interest is if we were able to give PrEP every six months, uh, that would be, I think, a, a real game changer in terms of feasibility for a lot of people and for a lot of places around the world if we were able to do that. I will close there and I will turn it back to Hillary and Brian. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.